Welcome to Open Door Church. We're glad that you have come. Uh, we are excited about the day and all that's taking place. I hope that you have planned to be with us uh, early afternoon for the picnic. We'll go over there and get set up just as soon as we can after, after church. So if you didn't bring any food with you, uh, go home and get it and come join us, okay? And so uh, we hope to see you up there at the property at that time this afternoon. We certainly have guests among us, some folks from Arkansas, that I hope that you'll take time to get to meet them and know them, and, and uh, they will be a blessing to your life. So I'm going to say a little bit more about them in just a, just a bit, but before um, I do and before we worship, let's go to the Word of God. Let me share with you the passage of Scripture that uh, we have come to in our study of the book of Philippians. And I pray that it might be a blessing to you today. This is from Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12, where the Word of God says this, Not that I have already attained, or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Would you bow with us for prayer, please, as we begin? Dear God, during this time, I pray, dear God, that you would just reveal yourself to every person. Lord, I pray that you would draw people to yourself, that you would encourage those who are downcast, that you would, Lord, bless all who have come. As we lift our voices in song, I pray that you'd be glorified in this. Lord, I ask that uh, you would receive this worship. Lord, we love you today. We thank you that you are so wonderfully gracious to us, and we just... Seek to bless your holy name. Thank you for each one who is here. I pray your blessings on their lives. But Lord, I know the greatest blessing is knowing you and being able to walk with you. So we give ourselves to you now in worship and in praise. Amen.
What? We have the prettiest children in all the world right here. Yes, you are. That's right. And I brought something with me. Let me get it out, see if you know what it is. What is this? Does anybody know? No. 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 <laughs> anybody know what this is? No. You mean your mama doesn't have one of these? No. No, they doesn't. You know what this is? This is, this, this is what you do when you knit something together. These are knitting needles, and you knit things together and make something. Now, what does this look like that's being made here? Can you tell? Can you tell what that is? It's what? A towel. A towel. It could be a towel. A blue towel. What else could it be? What do you think? A blue towel. A blue towel, okay. I'll have to tell the owner that that's what this is, and he didn't know it. All right, see, there's the, there's the yarn, and, and it's, got the, it's got it all ready. Do you know what he told me this was? Do you know what he told me this was? He told me this was a blanket. Does that look like a blanket to you? No. No. <laughs> could you cover up with this? No. No, maybe you could cover your ears up with it, right? Yeah, maybe the ears, but not all of you. That's that's supposed to be a that's gonna that's a blanket. Now, what if he stops right now? Would that be a good blanket? No. No, it wouldn't be a good blanket at all, would it? It would just be a little bitty thing, and you'd think, "Wow, I wish he'd finish that," because it sure gets cold up here sometimes, right? It sure gets cold, and I need a blanket. I wish he'd finish that. Well, I borrowed that from him because. I was thinking about the fact that, you know, the, he, he got a good start, didn't he? Is this a good start? No. Doesn't it look pretty good? That's a good start. But you know what? Sometimes we start really well and we never finish. We never finish. And that's kind of sad, isn't it? When you start and you never finish, that's, that's pretty bad. And there's a lot of times when we set out to do something for God that we start... We think, wow, look what I can do that God wants me to do. And then we stop and we never finish. You think that's good? To stop and never finish something you start for God? I don't think so either. It'd be like trying to cover yourself up with this on a cold winter night and say, that's the only blanket that I have. And now you say, that's not enough. That's not enough. You know, God has something special for you. He has a plan for your life. And I hope all of you can know what that plan is and that you can finish whatever it is God puts on your heart to start. So let's bow together for prayer and just thank God that He loves us enough to be so patient with us and so loving with us and He helps us whenever we set out to do something for Him. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your blessings. I thank You for each of these children. Dear God, as I look at them, I see all the potential that you have in their lives for them just making a difference for them loving you so much that they'll do what you call them to do what you lead them to do so I pray for them and for their families today and pray you'll bless them and father help us that the things that you put on our hearts to do that we wouldn't be satisfied just beginning well 
but that we'll want to finish what we started. Lord, we love you today and thank you for loving us. Bless the children now as they go to their class. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. You that are kindergarten and younger, y'all can go to class. Thought I'd share a picture or two with you. If uh, Eric has those for you, and I'll explain what you're looking at. Uh, work. Go ahead. Work. Go ahead. It looks like more work. All right. There. Now what are you looking at? You know what you're looking at? Church. You're looking at our annex. You're looking at the... You see there? Right there. Right there. Just this side of those brick walls. That's our children's classrooms. You see it? Isn't that glorious? That's the restrooms. Are you excited? Isn't that wonderful? All right. Just want you to see that. What else you have? All right. There is our parking lot. Great. We have a parking lot. You have cars. We need a parking lot. We have a parking lot. Go ahead. There is our sanctuary. And you notice it's already filled. Isn't that great? You thought we were going to fill it up, right? Well, it's already getting full with all types of stuff. It's, it's just about filled. There's our sanctuary. Who said we didn't have a place to meet? All right, what else? And there, you can never guess what that is. That's our kitchen. That's our kitchen. You know, we've started well. God put something on our heart. We started well. Anybody that hasn't seen it, anybody that didn't see it in the beginning might think, wow, you guys have a lot to do. Anybody that did see it at the beginning says, wow, you guys have done a lot. A lot has taken place. And what would it be if we stopped right now? A blanket. A blanket. <laughs> uh, what would it be if we stopped right now? We say we started this for the glory of God, but what would it be if we stopped right now? If we had for a parking lot a mud hole? If we had for a children's annex? For a classroom annex? If we just had an empty uh, nothing? I mean, we've even taken the slab out, so it doesn't even have that anymore. It's just dirt. A few bricks. You want to come and get some exercise. A few blocks that may still need to be moved, but that's what you have. Looking on the inside, what do we have? If you look up, it's glorious. I mean, that ceiling is, is beautiful. It is beautiful. Thank God for uh, these guys. Brother Fred, as he started it last year, cleaning and getting it ready. For Elazar, as he finished what Fred started and has worked so diligently. Praise God for that. But with the ceiling finished, if we stop now, what do we have? Have we glorified God if we stop now? My answer is, no, we have not. Anything that you start well, if you do not finish well, it is not to the honor of God. It is to our shame. I don't want to be left with a mud hole for a parking lot. I don't want to be left with just a uh, room filled with stuff that are supposed to be in the construction. I don't want to be left with that at all. I want to finish well. And I believe that you do too. Now, I mention that to you, not for the sake of, of saying, hey, we got a lot of work to do. I mention that to you to say, what is it when God begins working in your life and you set out to do something for God, and you start well, and then you stop short? When you begin, but you never finish. Many people set out to do the will of God and set out to do something and accomplish something, but if that's where they stop, what is that? Now, whenever you seek to do something for God and you stop in the middle of it or you stop uh, somewhere along the way, there'll always be people who come up to you and say, it's okay, you tried, God understands. I don't know about that. God's put it on my heart to do it. He said that whatever He begins, He finishes, right? He said He began a good work in you, and He said He will complete it. 
So for us to be godly, for us to be like God, then we need to finish what we start. And whenever God puts something on our heart, He doesn't tell us something to do today and then change His mind tomorrow. No, if it was His will yesterday, it's His will today, and it's His will tomorrow, and we just keep going forth and seek to accomplish it for the glory of God. I want to take you to a passage of Scripture today. I believe the greatest disaster, the greatest problem is that so many Christians have been satisfied with stopping short of what God wanted them to do. I believe that when people start out as a believer, they have all types of, of desire for God to be glorified. Somewhere along the way, they see others who are not so excited and they begin to drift and begin to fail. And that's certainly not what God intends. I want to share with you a message this morning entitled, Finishing Well. The text is from the third chapter of the book of Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippians. And the words that we find here are very personal. You see, Paul considered himself to have rounded the last turn in a race that he had begun when he met Jesus personally. He had started well, having personally encountered the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. He had run well, having been used of God to carry the gospel to many cities. And it didn't matter what obstacles were in his way, he stayed faithful. But that was not enough to Paul. His desire, his heart's desire was that he might be able to finish well. Taking you to a different text, because we are going to be in the third chapter of Philippians. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He said, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified." You see, Paul knew that despite all that he had suffered for the cause of the gospel, that there was still the possibility that he might not finish the race well. Listen to verse 12 of our text. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 says this. He says, Not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Paul is at the point in his life when he could see the finish line. When he could see the finish line. And he was determined not to take his eyes off of it. He was determined that he was going to reach it. Now to do otherwise was to enter heaven knowing that he had missed out on something wonderful that the Lord desired for him. Now friend, none of us enter this race to do the will of God to experience God's will in our own lives alone. We don't do that alone. We all need people to encourage us, and that's the church. Amen. Encouraging. Oh, give an encouraging word to your brother or sister. Build them up. Help them. Don't give them excuses for bad behavior. Don't encourage them when they need to be challenged. But when you see somebody wilting, when you see somebody faltering, when you see somebody going through trouble, certainly lift them up. And when you're the one who is wilting and faltering and needs to be strengthened, there'll be somebody else there for you. We need others to come to our aid to encourage us, to provide refreshment for us. And you know that the Holy Spirit is present in the life of every child of God, and thus the goal that has been set before us that task that he has set before us, it is attainable that you can accomplish the purpose for which Christ laid hold of you. Because as soon as you accept Jesus, he has a purpose for your life. He has something he wants you to accomplish for his glory. And you just need to walk daily in faith seeking to be used of him. Now I'm going to assume that you realize that with Paul that you have not already obtained all that Christ intended for you. 
Now, if you think all he intended for you was to get you saved so that you wouldn't go to hell, you missed the point. You missed the point. I'm going to assume that you understand that you've not already obtained all that Christ intended for you and that you realize that you have not already become perfect. Now, we'll talk about that in just a minute. I'm also going to assume that you desire to finish the Christian life well in order that you may do, as Paul said, may lay hold of that for which also you were laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Now, if those assumptions are true, this text will be an encouragement to you in your personal life, and I pray that it will. So let's talk about finishing well. Let me say to you that there is one thing to do. Now, nobody can do everything and be successful at everything. And hope of success, any hope of success, requires a concentration of effort. You know that gifted athletes often have to choose one sport, or even at times one event in that sport, over all others in order that they might give themselves to it and gain mastery over that one thing so that they can be successful. We must choose to finish the course that God has set before us and refuse to be deterred. So what do we need to do? We need to sharpen our purpose. Listen to what he says in verse 13. He says, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do. I have no doubt that Paul could have been successful at many things. He could have chosen to be a great teacher, and he would have been one of the greatest ever. He could have chosen to be a great lawyer, and surely he is, even with what he did, an example to all who would practice law in the way that he brought forth arguments. He chose instead to be a great follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, do you have a specific purpose in your life? If not, my guess is that you've never yielded completely to God and to His will. You know that Paul encouraged us in Romans 12 too, saying, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, which is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, he knew God's will. And he knew that there's not three levels of God's will where one is good and one's acceptable and one is perfect. No, the will of God is good and acceptable and perfect. Those three in one. He knew God's will. And he eliminated all of the things in his life that were simply good and acceptable and gave his attention to that which was good, acceptable, and perfect. And perfect. You see, that's what we should desire. You say, well, maybe I haven't been everything I ought to be, but maybe God is pleased with me. Maybe it's enough. Well, I don't like that attitude. Maybe it's enough. If I were coaching a baseball team, it wouldn't be enough for me just to say, well, I, you know, I did okay. For the guys on the team or the girls on the team to say, I did okay. I put forth some effort. You know, I did well enough to stay in the starting lineup and that was good enough for me. No, I'd want people saying, I want to be the best that I can at what I'm supposed to be doing. And I believe that God deserves what? Our best. Our best. Our best. Not just something that's good. You can do a lot of good things. Not just something that's acceptable. So, you know, you can say, well, this would be, you know, maybe this will please God. But do that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, we dare not have as our purpose just finding something to do in service to God. We should be searching for His perfect will. To do anything else is to follow a fork in a road that leads us away from the goal that our God has set before us and we will not finish the course He has set before us. You see, there's one thing to do. To do that one thing, you need to sharpen your purpose. Focus on that one thing. And He also tells us we need to shelve our past. He said, forgetting what lies behind. You know that a successful runner, and the Apostle Paul uses the Olympic Games as his example many times, you know that a successful runner looks only ahead. He does not glory in how fast he has gotten to where he is. He doesn't think about the fact that maybe he stumbled a little bit coming out of the starting, off the starting blocks. 
He can't focus on those things or he will fail to do his best. Paul didn't concentrate on his past failures. And he, like all of us, fell short. But he accepted those failures. There was no way he could go back and run that part of the race over again. And you need to understand that some people stumble and fall. And because of that, they say, I can't be used of God. I, I can't glorify God because I failed in this fashion. I think we need to forget the things, the things that are behind. We'll never totally forget it, but we can choose not to remember it to keep us to let it be a stumbling block in our way. Whatever's taking place in your life, it doesn't, that's not the important thing. It's what can take place in your life. And even those things in which we stumble, we can, as we yield that to God, He can use that to minister to other people. No, he confessed his failures and they were forgiven by the Lord and since God didn't remember them against him, he chose to do the same. You see, Paul didn't concentrate on those past failures. He didn't concentrate on his past successes either. He rejoiced in those, but he looked only to them as that would help him to run the race that was before him. Folks, one of these days we're going to have time to look back and see all that God has accomplished through us. One of these days... That day will come when days are no more. That day will come when we're standing in the presence of God. Throughout eternity, when He says, well done, you've been a good and faithful servant, then we can say, wow, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I did so little, but it was for you. It was for your glory. One thing to do. Sharpen that purpose. Shelve that past and stretch your possibilities. Now this is where people sometimes uh, have trouble because this is going to take some effort. He says, and reaching forward to what lies ahead. And reaching forward to what lies ahead. If you looked at his life, you would know he's coming toward the end of life. And he knew it. But he reached forward to what was ahead. The picture is that of a runner whose great desire is to reach the goal. Once the goal is in sight, his pace quickens. It doesn't slow. As the closer we get to the end of the race, the more that we should be accomplishing for the glory of God. The more we should accomplish. As that runner runs... It is as though his hands are reaching out toward what his eyes see. His feet pursue the vision of the eyes and the desire of the hands as quickly as they are capable of doing. Maybe the problem for so many is the lack of desire. You see, if the heart is not in it, the eyes will be focused elsewhere and the hands will hang limp in a purposeless dangle at their side. And what a pitiful sight that is. When that is true, the feet will have an uncertain path to follow. Such a picture as that should never be the picture of those whose desire is to live a life that will bring glory to Almighty God. Wouldn't it be awful if that was the picture of the modern, of the Christian, of, of your Christian life, or your, this was it, you know? Wouldn't that bless everybody's heart if we just all walked around like that? You know, I, can, I, I did the best I could, and it's, it's time for me just to give up and quit. You know, I've stumbled. I've had some problems, so, you know, it's, that's terrible. Wouldn't that be awful? If you ever see me like that, just slap me on the back and say, get back to it, man. No time for that. You've got a, you've got a path to follow. You've got a, a course to finish. There's one thing to do. I want to tell you there's one goal to reach. Notice what he says in verse 14. He says, I press on toward the goal. We need to press onward toward the goal. Now before he met Jesus, he had pursued those who were followers of Jesus. He pressed on in his pursuit of them, tirelessly working to punish them for daring to spread the gospel. But now he pursued the goal that God had set before him just as tirelessly. He refused to allow his weariness to keep him from reaching the goal that the Lord had set before him. He's tired. He was tired. He was spent. He could say like so many of us say, I'm not what I used to be. Uh, pitiful way. Pitiful, pitiful, pitiful. 
He refused to allow his weariness to keep him from reaching the goal that God has set before him. You know, the runner who wins the marathon, now I've never been in a, uh, in a marathon, I've never been a runner. I figure I ought to save these legs for the future, you know. I, I just figured don't wear them out too soon. That would be a terrible thing. I've never been one, but I know this. When I've talked to guys who ran that, they tell me that there are times as they run that they're ready to quit. They don't know if they can push themselves any further. They don't know if they can continue. But the Apostle Paul, his goal was to finish, and so he presses on. So whatever's happening in your life, I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to press on. Don't give up. If you've fallen in the race, get back up. Let somebody give you a hand. Reach out for somebody. I mean, I believe if somebody has fallen and they're reaching that hand out for somebody to help them, you know what people are going to do? They're going to pull you up. They're going to pull you up. Press on. Look at it again. He tells us to press upward toward God. He says in verse 14, I press on for the prize of the upward call of God. You see, the, the Christian's call is an upward calling. It is a calling to draw nearer to our God in heaven. You see, God calls us to reach up to Him, and we know by His promise that He's always reaching down for us. If you draw near to God, what's He going to do? He's going to draw near to you. We, we reach up desiring that His will be accomplished in us and He reaches down to strengthen us for the race. Now we know this, this goal, this upward call of God, we know this, heaven is our home. And you know when a soldier's duty takes him into a foreign land, his heart yearns for home. He fights the battle knowing that he's fighting for those who are back home. Friend, heaven is, a worth, is, is the place that we fight for, that we run for, that we wrestle for, and we must keep our eyes upon heaven if we're to finish this race successfully. The prize of the upward calling of God. It's not, that, it's not that if you run well, you get the prize of getting to go to heaven. We get to go to heaven because of Jesus, right? But we get to stand in the presence of Jesus and present our lives to Him. And hear him tell us, well done. Well done. Well, if that's not your heart's desire, I don't understand it. He tells us in verse 14 to press forward in Christ. He said, I press on in Christ Jesus. Jesus said to all of his followers in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And he said, go therefore. So we press forward to fulfill God's will in the authority of Christ Jesus. And we can run the race because he is the one who paid our entrance fee into the race. If people are racing and they're not even qualified to be in the race, what is that? That's nothing. So it's not running well enough that he'll accept you. He has paid the price for you. Now you are a child of God. Now you have a purpose. Now you can continue. Now you can run that race well. And we stay in that race because he is our strength. How many mornings do you get up and you get on your knees and say, God, I can't handle it today. I'm tired. I'm weary. Lord, I don't know that I can do it today. And you stay on your knees and he says, don't worry, I've got it. You just be obedient. I'll take care of it. And you come to the end of the day and you say, look what God did in my life today. Look at what He did for the glory of God. Press forward in Christ Jesus. Not in the flesh, but in Christ Jesus. Not trying to please others, but trying to please Christ Jesus. You are pleasing to Him if you're just being obedient to Him, whatever that means, whatever that is for you. Finishing well. You see, there is one thing to do and there is one goal to reach. But I want you to notice also, and you need to keep this in your mind, that there is only one judge to please. Only one judge to please. We get so caught up trying to please people. 
I'm the third out of four children. That makes me, I guess that's a middle child, right? And they're, they're the ones that's people pleasers. Is that right? Is that what they tell you? I don't know. I don't understand any of that. But I, but I know I like people's approval. I need people's approval. No, I really don't. <laughs> I, I, maybe I need it in the flesh. But you know what I need to live for? It's not the approval of people. It's the approval of Christ. One judge to please. And notice that here that he expects a very high standard from you. You know what he expects? He expects perfection. You say, well, I'll give up right now because I'm not perfect. Notice what he says. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. You see, you've already been perfected in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're already complete in Christ. You are a child of God. Now, you expect adults to act like adults, right? And God expects those who have been perfected to act like what? Those who are perfect. We've been perfected in Christ, so what does He expect of us? He expects us to act perfectly. In other words, there's never an excuse for sin. There's never an excuse for disobedience. Now, remember what Paul said in verse 12. He said, not that I have already obtained or have already become perfect. However, here he speaks to us as those who are already perfected. And so again, I say to you, he means that in Christ we've been completed, in Christ we've been perfected, and all we all have that need to successfully complete the race in which we've entered. But we've not yet completed it. You've often heard it said, maybe you've heard it said, that you know God still has a purpose for you because you're still breathing. And I believe that. As long as you're drawing breath, there's a purpose for you. God has something for you to accomplish. It may be different than what He had you accomplish yesterday, but He has something for you to accomplish. In Christ we are perfected. Nothing needs to be added to what He's done for us as we came to Christ. But Christ's work in us needs to come to a point of completion. We have not yet allowed God to fully do through us what He intended us to do when He completed His work in us and made us the children of God. So yes, He expects perfection. He expects us to cooperate with Him as He finishes the work He started in us. Will we be perfect? We're only perfect in Him. I don't go through a day that I, that I can say to Martha, yeah, didn't I do perfect? Wasn't I perfect today? She'd tell me the truth. And that would just be discouraging, so I never asked that, right? Well, we're not going to be perfect. We're not going to do everything perfectly, but my desire is to be perfectly obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. At least when I'm walking in the Spirit, that's my desire. If I give in to the flesh, my desire changes completely. And so it becomes about me and what I want to do. And I make all kinds of excuses for me. So you say, I'm just like you. But I know I, my God deserves my very best. You know what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10? It says, for we are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God pre prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. In other words, what did I say? God has a purpose for your life. Now, as servants of God, we will stand before Him to give account of how we've responded in obedience to His desire for us. He's holy, perfectly holy, and He expects Perfection, In other words, He expects maturity. He expects us to strive to be obedient to Him in all things. And so if there's something in my life that I know is displeasing Him, I need to do away with it, be done with it for Him, for His sake. He expects perception. Look at verse 15. It says, And if in anything, listen to Him, you have a different attitude, God's going to deal with you. Isn't that what He says? God will reveal that also to you. Some people use the alibi that they don't know the will of God for their lives. Well, let me tell you something. If you're listening to God, He'll speak to you. 
You don't have to wonder this morning if you have to if you have the right attitude toward the things of God. All you have to do is listen to the Holy Spirit of God as He speaks to you, and He will speak to you. Our problem usually is not that we do not know the will of God. Our problem is that we are not willing to yield ourselves to do the will of God. It's like we don't trust Him. God, if I surrender completely to you, where are you going to send me? What am I going to have to do that I don't want to do? What a terrible thing that is. What an awful thing that is. Surrender yourself completely and then watch Him open up for you what He has for you. The outside world may not see a lot of difference, but you'll see a world of difference in your attitude. You know, Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they do what? Follow me. Are you a sheep? Are you one of His sheep? Are you from His flock? If you're part of the flock of God, you hear His voice. Have you ever seen anybody cover their ears and say over and over again, I can't hear you, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. Well, I trust that's not how you're responding to the voice of God. What does he expect? He expects persistence. Look at verse 16. He says, however, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. The runner in the race should never slow down and give up. The devil would like nothing more than for us to stop short of the goal, for us to leave the work incomplete, for us to not let Jesus have full control of our life day by day as we seek to uh, get through this life. Satan would delight for those who have been running well to decide that they're going to lower their standards and begin to walk where they for once ran. How can we ever do that? Why would we ever do that? So what do we need to do? We need to run the race. And He will enable us to run that race well. Keep on. Don't stop. Why? Because there's too much at stake. Our God, the Bible tells us, for God so loved... Who? The world. The world. And then Jesus told us, you are the light of the world. Do we have a purpose? Yes. We live in a dark, decaying world. And we've been called to be the salt and to be the light. But if we give up, if we stop short, if we take our eyes off the goal of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus, then we are going to fail. And we'll not be the only ones who suffer. It'll be those around us who suffer. People want to talk about whether we can lose our salvation. We're children of God. You don't lose that. What we ought to be more concerned about is about fulfilling God's plan. You see, if you're worried about losing heaven, your life's going to be about you. If you're concerned about displeasing or, or not fulfilling the will of the God of heaven, then your focus can be about others and not about you. Isn't it amazing that God has given us such a marvelous gift that His own Son would die on a cross for us, that He would give His life and sacrifice for us. Isn't it an amazing thing that He died, Christ died for the sins of the whole world? And they don't even know it. We have a race to run. We have tasks to finish. It's not about buildings. It's about souls. It's about the children of God being obedient to do what God has called us to do. And when you do, you'll be blessed and you'll be a blessing. And God will do amazing things. Many times I hear some of you talk about it and say, God has done some amazing things in this church. He's worked miracles in this church. And He has. Do you agree? He has. We say that. Why did He do that? Why has He done what He's done? It wasn't just that He pats us on our head and say, this is your reward today for being good. 
Notice he says, I have set something in front of you. Now be obedient. Follow me and I'll lead you into all joy. I'll lead you into all peace. I'll lead you into the greatest purpose that there could be. So wherever you are in your life, keep your eyes on the goal. Don't be distracted. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Not you. He. Our Lord Jesus. What a tragedy. When some great purpose is not fulfilled. I don't want that to be true in my life. And I don't want that to be true in your life. I want Jesus to be glorified in you. Even as He, I want Him to be glorified in me. That's the goal. Keeping our eyes on Christ and just being obedient to Him and seeing Him do something that is amazing. For the Jim talked about some of the things that we've seen happen. Some of the things He allowed us to be a part of and many times it was something that we just stood back and said, wow, look what God did there. Look at how He took care of that need. Look at what He accomplished. But I know this. He's not through. He's not through. What He did over there, He can do right here. And we can see these towns. We can see these cities impacted for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't put us here for us. He put us here for His glory. And He's going to do something amazing. Are you ready to let Him do something amazing in you personally? Now, if you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ, that's where you must start. That's where you must begin. Don't try running the race without Christ. If you try to enter the race on your own and in the flesh, you will stumble, you will fall, you will be... It'll be a disaster. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, you need to start right there and put your faith and trust in Him. Accept Him as your Lord. He is the Lord. And accept that gift of salvation. He gives you eternal life. And He gives you an eternal purpose. Have you trusted Jesus? Have you received Jesus into your life? Accepted His gift? If you know that you're saved, you know that that has taken place. If there's somebody here that you feel like that you're on the sidelines... God's finished with you. Oh, what does you've been deceived? You've been deceived. The greatest purpose still lies ahead. We're going to stand and we're going to sing. Our worship team will come and lead us. This is a time of opportunity, a time of decision. I don't know how God's spoken to your heart. I can only deal with what He's spoken to me about. This is an opportunity for you to respond to Him. So we're going to ask you in just a moment to stand and sing with us. I'll be here at the front. I'm not going to stand right here in the front. I'll be standing over there. You just leave where you are and come talk with me. We'll pray together. We'll talk together. Whatever we need to do, we'll do that. You can come and you can kneel here and pray even as Brother Fred is doing now. You respond to God. Let Him speak to your heart. Stand with us as we sing, and you do what God would have you to do. song
Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming and being with us. I hope you will take advantage of the opportunity this afternoon to uh, come up to the property. And I think the rain is supposed to hold off till, I don't know, at least 2 o'clock. Uh, <laughs> what's that? It's next week? <laughs> it needs to hold off till next week, 2 o'clock. But uh, what's that? Friday evening. Friday evening, okay. It can start raining Friday evening. You pray that the God, he, the God who's in control of all things, He'll cause those storms or those rains to go around us so that this work might be accomplished. So let's begin today with a picnic. You know, when you have a, a rainy forecast, you have a picnic. But if you want to be inside, uh, some ladies did some great work setting up tables inside. It's uh, inside the, uh, the mansion. You know, we've got a mansion just over the hilltop, so, uh, so come and join us there today, and, and God will be honored in that. Tomorrow evening, uh, we will be having a prayer meeting. Uh, it is a prayer meeting, so come expecting to pray. Um, we're going to meet at the Mission House, which I think is where the team is going to be taking their meals, and so if you get there on time, maybe you'll get dessert, but uh, uh, come and and pray with us at that time. We need to bathe this. Everything's happening this week in your life, in the church's life. We need to bathe it in prayer. We need to pray that God will send revival to the churches. We need to pray that God will bring a new, fresh awakening, spiritual awakening here in this land. Will you pray with us about that? If you can join us at 6.30 tomorrow night at the Mission House, and what a mission that is, just to seek the face of God. God bless you. May He be your joy, your strength in everything that you do this week. May He bring you comfort in times of sorrow and strengthen all the difficulty. May He bless you in a way that glorifies Him. And may you be aware that that's where the blessing originated and give Him praise for it. Welcome, if you will, our guest. Thank you for coming. Hope to see you up at the property this afternoon. We'll eat whenever we get things ready to eat, okay? So go home and grab something. If you left it at home, come join us. God bless you. You're dismissed.